We've known since the 1800s that greenhouse gases are the thermostat of the planet. We've known that extraction and combustion of fossil fuels increases levels in the atmosphere, and we've even known that as those levels increase, the planet warms. Since the 1900s, we've known that climate is changing, humans are responsible, and the risks are serious. What risks do climate change pose to our society? They can be summarized in just one word, stationarity. The fact that over the course of human civilization on this planet, the climate at the global scale has been remarkably stable. Some of that is luck, and of course, some of that is no accident because large-scale deforestation and the development of agriculture and cultivation of livestock contributed to and reinforced that stability. But today, we know that that stability lies far behind us. Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are now higher than they've been in 15 million years. And as my colleague Bob Kopp and I wrote a few years ago in this editorial for ERL, while Aristotle might argue that humans were not responsible for choices made at the beginning of the industrial era, regardless of our original ignorance, however, over the last few centuries, we have indeed been conducting an unprecedented experiment with the Earth's climate system, the only home that we have. Our entire society is built on an assumption that we rarely take out and look at, the assumption that our climate is stable, that the highs and the lows that we've seen in the past and the long-term average are all reliable predictors of future conditions. And don't get me wrong, this assumption has served us well in the past, and that is why it is so ingrained into our society at every level. Like what? It determines our residential and commercial building codes, what types of crops we grow, where, when, and how, the energy and water demand that we plan for, where we draw our flood zones, whether we invest in snow removal capacity or not. All of these are based on the assumption of stationarity that the past can be used as a predictor for the future. But planning for the future based on the past is like driving down the road looking in the rearview mirror. It works great when the road is relatively straight and when climate is relatively stable. But when there's a curve in the road, we know that it fails. And this is where we are today. We are, all of humanity, in this bus rounding the curve and our wheels are already hitting the curve. I checked and no one was harmed in this actual accident that happened in February last year. The non-stationarity of the climate system affects what? It affects our infrastructure design, food production, energy and water supply, our insurance and costs of living, our maintenance of infrastructure. It also disproportionately affects certain people and certain populations, magnifying the fault lines that run through our society and our civilization. Women and children are disproportionately affected by climate impacts, especially in poor countries. Indigenous peoples who have already lost so much are disproportionately affected. Right here in the US, communities of color and marginalized communities that are already overexposed to pollution and experience other types of scarcity are also disproportionately impacted by the impacts of a changing climate. And the non-stationarity of our climate also affects the economy. It affects security and conflict. It affects our health in fundamental ways. In fact, I don't think it's going too far to say that it affects the viability of civilization as we know it. In 2019, the Oxford Dictionary selected climate emergency as the word of the year. They define it as a situation in which urgent action is required to reduce or halt climate change and avoid potentially irreversible environmental damage resulting from it. So if this is the case, why are we not treating it like an emergency? So often our answer to that question focuses on people's lack of acceptance of the science. And as we can see from this recent map from the Yale Program on Climate Communication, lack of acceptance of the science is a real problem. There are large areas of the country where less than 50% of people agree that climate is changing due to human activities. But what I want to argue here is that I don't think that's our biggest problem. It certainly is a problem, don't get me wrong, but I think that we have an even bigger one that is preventing us from treating climate like the emergency that it is. And these maps explain, let me show you. 
So if you ask people, is global warming happening? It turns out that 72% of people say, yes, it is. And then you say, will it harm plants and animals? Yes. Will it harm future generations? People say, yes. What about people in developing countries? The numbers start to fall slightly, but we're still well over half of people in the US say yes, 65%. Do you think it will harm people in the United States? And 61% of people say yes. But then there's one more question. And this question reveals the real problem. They said, do you think global warming will harm you personally? And look at this. Most areas of the country, except for areas with many Hispanic Catholics who are very concerned about climate change, with many Native Americans also concerned, with the exception of those few counties, the large majority of the country, including places where people completely agree with the science, don't think it matters to them personally. There is a term for this. It is called psychological distance. It refers to issues that are distant in time, the future, not now, issues that are distant in space, happening to other people or other things far away from us, abstract rather than concrete, you know, invisible heat trapping gases, global temperature increasing, and irrelevant to our primary concerns. They matter to people who might be environmentalists or scientists, but not to me. So a few weeks ago, I did a podcast for Esri, and I was asked, how would you talk about Greenland melting or the Siberian heat wave or the fact that the polar bears are in danger to people in Iowa? And I said, I wouldn't. What would I talk to people in Iowa about? I would talk to them about how heavy precipitation has increased their flood risk. I would talk to them about how droughts are stronger and longer in a warmer world. How farmers are getting on board with smart farming techniques that will put carbon back in the soil. How Iowa State University is researching biochar, which is a fantastic way to take the carbon and vegetation and put it back in the soil where it's a fertilizer how there's startup companies like the Renewable Energy Group out of Ames, Iowa, that are taking waste agricultural products and waste oils and turning them into biodiesel. That's what I would talk about in Iowa. All right, so how does this relate to policy? You probably already got the idea, but let me spell it out. I'm an atmospheric scientist, but eight years ago, I moved to a public administration program where we train public servants, so policymakers and decision makers. I didn't know much about public administration, and the very first event that my new program was hosting was an orientation for the graduate students, where the guest speaker was the city manager from the city of Amarillo, now the city manager in Lubbock. So he had decided to speak on the 10 biggest challenges that he had faced in his career so far in Amarillo. And as he went through the 10 challenges, not only was I interested to hear what those were and how they handled them, but I became increasingly fascinated because I realized that the majority of things on his list, I can't remember for sure, but I think it was something like seven out of 10, had something to do with climate change. Like what? Well, like the economic downturn that was caused by the 2011 to 2012 drought, the fact that they had to redraw their flood zones because heavy precipitation was getting more frequent, they had to rehome Katrina refugees, it turned out that it wasn't a case of convincing people like Jarrett that they cared about climate change. They already did. They just didn't know it. Let me give you a second example. What about a water manager? For example, at the Canadian River Municipal Water Authority, which is nowhere near Canada, but it makes me feel sort of at home to talk about it. It's in Northwest Texas. So what do water managers care about? They care about ensuring their short-term water supply, their long-term water supply, maintaining water quality, managing their water resources, and maybe way down their list, they might care about climate change. But here's the thing. Why would anyone who manages water care about climate change? Because it affects your short-term supply, your long-term supply, the quality of your water, and more. So in other words, they already have every reason to care about climate change right at the top of their priority list. It isn't a case of moving climate change up the priority list. It's a case of connecting it directly to what is already at the top of the list. Now, some people say, yes, but we care about things that are really urgent right now, and they are, like issues of justice or environmental racism or poverty. 
And so they say, we'll worry about climate change later, but for now we have to fix these things. Well, even there, I would say, why do we even care about climate change? Because it takes these issues and it exacerbates them or makes them worse. If you try to fix these things without considering climate change, it's like you're pouring all of your money and all of your effort and all of your time and everything you have into a bucket with a hole in the bottom. And the hole is climate change and it's getting bigger and bigger over time. If we don't fix climate change, we can never fix any of these other issues. Perhaps the ultimate example, in my opinion, are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. You're probably familiar with them. They're very basic. Number one is no poverty. Number two, no hunger, good health, quality education, gender equity, clean water and sanitation. Down there at number 13, you have climate action. But I would argue that climate action doesn't even need to be on this list at all because the only reason we care about it is because it affects poverty, hunger, good health, education, gender equity, clean water, and more. So when we're talking to policymakers, we don't need to move climate change up their priority list. No, all we need to do is identify the top concerns they already have and then connect climate change to them. And that is a very different and frankly, much easier task. So how do we plan for non-stationarity in a changing climate? I would offer three concrete steps. The first step is to begin with the stakeholder and ask, what are they already or what have they been concerned about in the past, like Jared, the city manager, that would be affected by a changing climate? Then step two, as scientists, we can respond, could climate change exacerbate or actually help with some of these concerns? And then step three is the really interesting one, and this is the place where I work quite a bit. Together, decide what type of information do you need to incorporate non-stationarity into the decision-making process? We often jump directly to saying, oh, we need high-resolution climate projections. But here's the thing. Depending on what can be done with that information, all you might need to know is, is something becoming more or less frequent or more or less severe? Because if your response is the same, no matter whether it's getting twice as frequent or four times as frequent, why would you need the high resolution projections? Just simply a map showing you the, the relative trends in the region might be enough. So that's why it's so important at each step of the way to connect the stakeholders' needs, the stakeholders' concerns, and the stakeholders' decision-making process and ability to incorporate new information into the process and their response options to figure out what they really need. So while we often think that people need to understand the science and if they just understood the science, they would act, it turns out that what most stakeholders need to know is how climate change affects them. And I've seen examples right here in Texas where they may even accept that information and use it for the basis of planning without accepting the science and accepting the science comes after. In other words, the cart comes first, the horse comes later. So in conclusion, I really am convinced after thousands of conversations working with policy and decision makers across the spectrum in cities and water at the state level, ecosystem, land managers and more, that everybody we talk to already cares about climate change if they're involved in any type of planning. They just might not realize it. And that's a very different mindset than trying to make people care about something new when they are already overwhelmed. You're not asking for more of their attention. Instead, you're giving them information that helps them better meet the challenges that they are already focused on. Because the bottom line is this, if we don't fix climate change, it will fix us.